And good evening. I'm, uh, no, it's on this side again. I keep listening, forget which side. We're not looking in a mirror here. I'm Mark Evanier. Uh, the, uh, turning off my iPhone so I don't hear myself on delay. Uh, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, I am doing this as an experiment this week. For those of you who haven't seen my blog lately, I got this new toy. I got it because the Comic Convention in San Diego has asked me to do some panels online in lieu of an actual Comic-Con this year. Uh, it, it, I have known Sergio Aragonis since 1969, which is the last year that I did not go to a Comic-Con in San Diego during summer. I've been to every single one of them, and I did, I've done lots and lots of panels at them. And I decided, let me do some panels and put them online for people. And this Saturday at 1 p.m. Uh, on Pacific time, I am going to try to move one of my famous cartoon voice panels onto the Internet. I'm going to be doing it with five of the best cartoon voice actors in the business, and we'll see if we can replicate some of the experience of doing it in room 6A upstairs at the convention center. And the convention's going to actually put this on uh, the, their website and call it uh, WonderCon Online, and I'm going to keep doing some other panels for them there, and then eventually there'll be Comic-Con Online, and maybe may even stick this one at some point. These are kind of test broadcasts so I can learn this software and learn how to do this and decide you know, if I'm completely inept or, and I should leave it to others. Uh, tomorrow night in this space, I'm going to be interviewing a friend of mine named Shelley Goldstein, who is a wonderful comedy writer and a fabulous person when it comes to standing on stage and saying funny things and singing brilliant songs. You will love Shelley Goldstein. We'll be talking about, among other things, uh, the world of cabaret performing. I have this strange theory that after the current nastiness is over and we can actually all gather in, in individual places together instead of getting you know, our entertainment this way, uh, cabaret performing will be one of the first things that comes back, live performing with one person and a piano, piano player on stage. Another thing that will probably be dominant is comedy clubs. And on Friday, I've got a friend of mine who's going to be on here named Bill Kirkenbauer. I saw Bill in the comedy clubs around 1970. And at that time, the people in comedy clubs were not very good. Maybe it was 71 or so. And he stood out for me. I thought he was one of the funniest people I'd ever seen on a stage. And I knew he'd be, make it big. And a year or two later, Johnny Carson gave him the blessing, said, you are hilarious on my stage. You can have a career in show business. That's not exactly what Johnny said, but it had that effect. Bill went on to star in a couple of CV shows like Growing Pains, Just the Ten of Us. Most of us loved him as Tony Roletti on the old show Fernwood Tonight. He will be here. In the meantime, we're going to spend this next hour, hour and a half, I don't know how long this will run, talking with my best friend, and I have to qualify that when I say it, um, in the facial hair division, because a lady who's watching this now will be offended if I think he's my only best friend. Uh, would you welcome to the stage Mr. Sergio Aragonis, who I just clicked. There you go. Hello. Very good. Hello, hello. Good, e good evening, my friend. You are well. Thank you are you are you, yes. you are isol yes. you are isolated with your family. Yes, I'm uh -huh. still working, but isolated. Okay. So which instead is very of good. Yeah. Instead of sitting at your drawing board all day drawing, you are sitting at your drawing board all day drawing. Yes. <laughs> okay. Correct. T tell these people what you've been working on lately. Well, hi, guys. Uh, thank you. It's a pleasure. Not Sadly, I cannot see you guys, but I know you're there. And probably I know half of you <laughs> and the other people who I don't know. Very glad to meet you. And welcome to my studio. And uh, I'm working... Uh, mostly right now I'm, I'm working on writing because we have finished two issues of Gru, the comic series, uh, The Gods Against Gru, and I finished the Mad article for Mad. So right now I'm in the thinking process more than I'm the drawing thing, more of the drawing, more on the thinking part I'm, I, I'm doing right now. Tell them about the most recent drawing you did. Well, uh, this one, <laughs> the, the Mark and Sergio drawing. So, like no, this. no, no, no. The drawing you did for me. The drawing you did for me. Uh, oh, we well, we'll, uh, this is this is turned into a quick draw panel, folks. Did smart. Blah 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 blah
talking about. And there's my mouth up and up, up, up. Let's see, I mean, I just, you can see that. <laughs> there we are. That's it. Perfect like this. There we go. <laughs> so what are you saying? I'm sorry, Kurt. I draw. I don't. I well, you just, you, just, you just sent me a drawing you did about an, two yes. hours ago. Oh, yeah. Must be here someplace. Oh, wait, but I can save you the trouble. Okay. There, there it is. is. Tell us what this is for. Well, uh, I I was very fortunate to be asked to, to write an intro for the next uh, collection of Pogo, which uh, Mark Evanier is editing. And I have been a fan of Pogo all the way from Mexico with uh, only one inconvenience that I could never read it because the English was so difficult. And when I was a kid, I had some, some comics that I could copy because they were simple, like uh, Little King and uh, a Little Lulu and the, the, the easy ones to draw so I could copy them. But I have a book about Pogo and I try very hard to draw it and it was impossible because there were so many lines and so, so complex. It was so beautiful. So I talk about that on the intro and the drawing that I made for him is about that. It's me being a kid trying to draw. So if you want to show it again, they can see now on, let me... that what I did. So it was hard for me to draw it. So that's me with all kinds of uh, drawings well done. And in the empty space is text, of course. And that's a drawing I did of Pogo now. But me thinking, how come I cannot draw that good? Which uh, still is impossible, you know, because Pogo, Mr. Kelly, well, Kelly was probably to me one of the best artists ever on the ever so but impossible for me to understand what he wrote i still don't understand what he's saying before but uh uh yeah they saw it yeah okay uh, uh who were who were some of the other artists who inspired you at that age what other cartoons did you love at that age well we have to remember that in the 40s and early 50s there was no television telef and uh so my only inspiration were animation when my pa parents used to go to a meeting of uh, Spanish refugees. They, the war, they have everybody emigrate. You, you, were, you, were, you were in Spain at this time or you were in, Me back in Mexico? No, no. By now, uh, from Spain, I left when I was six months old. So I don't remember really anything about Spain. We went to France. And I went to school in France. And French was my first language. But... We had to let, leave because by 1942, by the end of 42, things were getting pretty nasty for Jewish people, the Spanish who have fought Franco, who was an ally of Hitler and gypsies and a lot of indesirables. So we had to leave. And the only country in those times that accepted Spanish refugees was Mexico. And so we took a ship from Casablanca, by the way. And there we go to Mexico. So. I arrived in Mexico, and the only draws I did when I was in France, I don't remember because I was very small, but I started at age six, drawing whatever I saw, and it was American cartoons from the newspapers. They were uh, uh, syndicated cartoons, and there were some that they were very easy to copy, and the animation. My parents will have this meeting that, and below where the place where they had the meeting was a theater that had a loop, a permanent loop of animation. Don't forget, all the cartoons were black and white. They were Coco the Clown. And uh, and to me, that was the things that I really wanted to draw more than anything else. You, 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 will, you will appreciate this. Uh, uh, Jason Nuttall just wrote to us, there's the Popeye lamp. He saw the yes. Popeye lamp in the drawing you just did. I have it right there. And, uh, Hold I don't have the uh, a shade because that disappeared a long time ago. But uh, after a couple of trips from Mexico, I, I I had to bring it back, so I have it here. It's just uh, we don't see it. It's among the things over there, but I still have it. So, we, but that one I draw a copy from the internet because I didn't want to bring that one down. But, yeah. Okay, clarify yeah. for us here. There are people in this uh, on the internet. I have to keep correcting who think your father directed the Sheena Queen of the Jungle TV show. No, what he was 
Cina, Queen of the Jungle. No. No. <laughs> she was uh, on the production end of it. What happened, and I, I can tell about the anecdote now that we're talking about that subject. At that time, when they were sh uh, shooting the uh, Cina, the, the, the television series, the company that did the Mexican production was uh, Rodriguez Hermanos. My father was the man production manager of the company. And he, they, uh, I used to go to a place called Las Estacas to uh, um, train and, and, and practice scuba diving because we were going to do a great competition. And it was a slalom, and that was a place to do it. So I went there almost a lot. This is, I'm talking 54, 50, 54, I think, or 55. And my father, the company was shooting Sheena over there. And I saw my father, I said, hello, and I asked, is Sheena around? I said, no, she said, oh, well, forget about it. I continue working. So then what happened is the stunt person that was going to do a stunt for Sheena didn't show up. And says, oh, well, we we all the way here, blah, blah, blah. And my father, of course, says, well, my son is a diver. He can dive from any place. And in that time, I was well built, but thinner. You know? So they decide that maybe I could do the stunt for, for Sheena. So they get me the Sheena clothing and the wig. And I did a dive for, for, for her to the water, doing a, a loop and falling into the pool. And, and this, is, this, is, this is the excuse you give for being caught in women's clothing. No, I, 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 I'm wearing skirts right now. But, oh. I, <laughs> no. All right. uh, but that was a, a stunt that I did, and uh, it was fun. But my father was not on the on the directing end of it. He was uh, on the production end of it, which he did his life. Hanging around in the studios, did you ever think yeah. you wanted to make your life's career in a movie studio or in that kind of realm? No, not at all, because it's. When you grow up in it, you see the reality of it. I love movies more than almost as much as cartooning, but working on it, it's a completely different thing. I never had the illusion to be on the biggest screen because to me, the biggest screen was an actor spending three hours on the makeup and then five hours sitting on that studio doing nothing except waiting for him to be called and then pretending to be something that on the movie wasn't even going to look like that because the stunt person did, did his thing. Yeah. So that was not what I wanted to do. I did theater later because it was fun, but it was just to know what it was all about. But the, the movie thing, in vacation, my father, my father put me to work at the studios. I did not the editing, but working on the editing room, rewinding the bobbin. I'm putting things and hanging tapes and all that, and I didn't like that. I didn't like any part of it, and I don't have the the sensibility to be a director for other persons. I'm kind of an easy person, and if it's good, good enough, I like it. Okay. A, a director has to want something specifically, and that's what he wants, no matter how much it costs. I'm not like that. If it's good. I work with it. You know. But as a as a cartoonist, you are a director yeah. in a sense, and you can. Yes. And you always seem to want crowd scenes. If you were directing movies, you want every scene to have eight thousand people in it. Yes. So. <laughs> and I can direct each one of them. I said, okay. you get dressed like that. You get dressed like that. You look at the camera. You don't. You pretend to be somebody else. It's a lot of fun. What age were you when you thought, "Gee, maybe I'm going to make be a cartoonist when I grow up"? I don't know. Thirty-five. No. <laughs> no, I never, when I was growing up, I never thought that cartooning was a profession. I, in the United States, you have the advantage that when you're very young, even many cartoonists that they are already in their 70s, they had schools for cartooning. They know that there was a studio doing it. There was syndication. I grew up not knowing that. I knew that the cartoons were in the newspaper and that some magic guy drew them and I wanted to draw. I never thought that you could make a living doing that, doing what you like to do. So I went to school. I, I went to architecture school. 
I probably thought I was going to be an architect, but I didn't really like it as much as I like cartooning. I love, I love the theory of it. But uh, I realized already as a, probably in my 20s that you could make a living a cartoonist because I was in high school. How old you are in high school? 16, 17. That's when I saw my first cartoon in 1954. 1954. There were cartoons that I did for the school newspaper. And my editor, who was a colleague in the class, sold them to a magazine called Haha, ha, who was a, a, a magazine that used a lot of American reprints. And so, because I never thought I could sell those things. You know? So that was probably the, the first moment I became a professional cartoonist. And uh, I didn't want to work that much at that because first, it didn't pay anything. And second, I was pretty bad. So I think I, I learned practicing. I'm still learning. Okay. Here, Sergio, would you translate this comment for me? Can you read it? Sergio, vos sos una de las razones por las que dibujo historietas. Cuando descubrí a los 12 años una revista de Gru, una feria del libro de Buenos Aires, que era... Che, che Leandro, todo bien. He's from Argentina. And uh, thank you, my friend. Thank you very much. I, I could name... A, I've been in your position so many times because when I met cartoonists that I had grew up with their work, I get totally like a little kid because I know exactly what you feel, my friend, because I'm there. I'm, I'm still there. I meet cartoonists, well, sadly, without my age, the, the really people that we grew up with uh, are not here among us anymore, but their work are. But I am enamored of many young cartoonists, too, because I love their work. So thank you. Gracias. Gracias. So Gracias. What, 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 what does this message say, basically? He says something it about... Says, Joe, you owe me $100. When are you going to pay me back? No. Okay, good. Fine. He says, uh, Sergio, you are one of the reasons that I draw comic strips or comics. When I discovered, when I was 12 years old, grew at the book fair in Buenos Aires, I fell in love. That's basically what he said. Yeah. That's good. Thank you Thank for the you. comment. At the end of this, uh, after I run out of questions, we're going to take a lot of questions from comments. If you ask questions now, they're just going to scroll off before we get to them. Uh, tell us about some of the cartoonists, the American cartoonists that you were so nervous to meet and thrilled. People, uh, people you met. Um, well, Otto Soglo. Otto Soglo was my king. My 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 adored person, and when I joined the National Cartoon Society, that was in the early '60s. I went to one of the meetings, and everybody was there. And and when I asked, he says, "Do you think Otto Soglo is here?" He drew the little king, and he says, "Yeah, sure, that's him." And I went to him, and he was very short. I I got mute. I didn't know what to say. And he kept looking at me with a big cigar, you know, and I, I, you know how fans are. Well, I was fanboy number one. And I try, I, I, my English then, as Mark can testify, was very close to nothing. So I was standing up. So he calls all the cartoonists. Uh, <laughs> see, this is a fan of mine. You see what I do with my fans? I leave them speechless. <laughs> so, but they became terrific. They became good friends and they embraced me. So it was Otto Soglo, Rube Goldberg, who was a great, I had great admiration for his trip. And I met him there the same day. And a, a sad one, it was that one of the dinners that at the NCS, I'm sitting on the table talking to some cartoonists. And there was this little old man sitting to one person separated from me, right? And he's sitting, and I'm not talking to him. I'm talking to the two people next to me. And when we finished having dinner, he left. And, and then says, man, are you lucky? You're sitting on the same table with a guy who draws, uh, 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 um, oof, I, I went blank, uh, uh, the best of the comic strips with a Prince Valiant. Hal Foster. Al Foster. Can you believe that I'm sitting there? And I didn't know, and I didn't say a, a word to him. And then when I was looking for him, I didn't find him. I met him later, and I expressed my emotion and my gratitude. But uh, 
that was something that is not on my style of cartooning. So it was just pure admiration, not not getting anything from him in the sense that the, uh, one of the guys that I met that I was enamored of his work because he decided the way I was going to draw noses. It was Virgil Parch. Virgil yes. Parch, yes. I saw his cartoon and I said, that's it. I have to draw noses like that because they're perfect. You know, pointy and the hands, amazing cartoons. I had a chance to meet him later. I'm a friend of mine and uh, that was great. That was great. I got to meet Virgil Parch. I was introduced to him by, and here's a name drop, Tex Avery. And I went to lunch with the two of them. Actually, I ate and they drank. And <laughs> and Virgil Parks was one of those great people who was as funny in person as his cartoons were. Yes. A lot of cartoonists yeah. are really boring, unfunny people in the in real life. Not you, but a lot of them. A lot of them are. A lot of them are. So they're only funny on the paper. All right. So now let's take. I, I wanna, there's an often told story here. I want to go through anyway about you finally came to, to the United States with your cartooning, and you starved. You did terrible. What did you do for money when you got to the United States? Well, the the first thing that I I did was that was I had. The first day, I didn't know anything. I had left my luggage on Penn Station, and I walked to the village because that's where I thought everything was happening. But I arrived there during the day, and the only thing I saw, there was a lot of Italian people, Italian ladies doing shopping, little Italian kids playing. Because it was little Italy, but I couldn't see any beatniks or anything related to art, except when the night came in, the whole place changed, and it was sensational. Hold on, we have a comment. Jules online, Jules Shepard, she, she loves us. Thank you. We love her very much, too. That's right. Thank you, Jewel. Go Thank ahead. You, Jewel. Sorry. Some things are no. worth inter interrupting you for. <laughs> oh, yes, they are. <laughs> so I, I am in the, in the village with no, no money because I came with 20 bucks. And by the time I arrived to New York, I have almost left. So I went to a hotel and the guy at the entrance says me, yes, says, I'm going to get a room. He says, no, you cannot afford it. I, I must have really looked poor then. So I slept on a bench. And the second night, I passed to a coffee house that uh, they had flamenco poetry. And there were some people getting very drunk, and they wanted a song called La, Ma uh, uh, La Malagueña. And the guys who were playing the guitar, they were playing the, the Spanish Malagueña by Lecuona, which is a very classic song. And they, no, no, they were saying no. So I knew that they wanted a Mexican Malagueña, which I knew. So I went in and says, if you want to get rid of these guys, let me sing it for them. And they, oh, please do. So I sang them the Malagueña. And the guy liked it. And uh, says, uh, sorry, this is a flamenco restaurant. So we don't do Mexican things. But do you know anything Spanish songs? He says, no, but I know Spanish poetry, Garcia Lorca. And says, okay, so you go in. So that was terrific. I went there and started reciting Garcia Lorca with a guy in the back accompanying me, Antonio Torre Heredia, hijo y nieto de Camborio, con una vara de mimbre a Sevilla de los Toros. And everybody, I finished and applauded. And I knew only about two by heart. So I look at the guy and says, continue. This has to be a little longer. So I didn't know anymore. So what I did is I took Mexican songs because I asked anybody speak Spanish and nobody did. So I tell them, okay. So I start reciting Mexican songs like with a, with a Spanish accent, with a flamenco accent, with a Mexican songs. And I covered my half hour faking it with a Spanish poetry with Mexican songs, rancheras, corridos with a, with a Spanish uh, son sonnet. And that's how I made my first money was uh, reciting poetry on the on the coffee house. That's it's great. Like, yeah. Now, by the way, they locked me there. <laughs> the first, the third night, I spent the whole day locked until they opened the restaurant. They forgot about me. They have let me sleep there. Uh, great story. All right. Now I want to get to the story about you going to the Mad Magazine offices. But first, I want to yes. do a little context here. You were going around trying to sell gag cartoons. Correct. And editors then did not want pantomime cartoons. 
That's and, cool. they, and they wanted something kind of a sophisticated thing that maybe wasn't your main strength at the time and such. Now, meanwhile, Mad Magazine was the leading humor publication in, in the United States. Yes. Mad Magazine was run by a man that you love dearly named Bill Gaines, William M. Yes. Gaines. Yes. And I think a lot of people don't know how much Bill Gaines' personality influenced Mad Magazine. Bill never wrote or drew anything for the magazine, but his spirit was all throughout it. And one of the things that you need to know about Bill Gaines to understand Mad is that he was a compulsive. He made lists. He kept he kept at his home, he had his soups alphabetized, his canned soups alphabetized, asparagus through zucchini. And if he used a can of tomato soup, he would go out and buy a new one to replace it because there always had to be three cans of tomato soup in his shelves. And he kind of ran mad the same way. A little more this way, a little more, a little more to the right, a little back for it. There we go. That's Bill Gaines. In the <laughs> illustration. Anyway, he didn't look like that when you first met him, but he, he, he no, grew no. up like that. Now, Bill looked at Mad as a family. And one of the things that's fascinating to me about Mad history is that whereas usually when a mag somebody has a success, they try to do more magazines, expand bigger, better. Bill wanted to keep the magazine small. He fought his whole life to keep Mad manageable so he could make all the paychecks out himself and he could have his office door open and, and talk to everybody. So it was very, and he took people on trips. We'll talk about the trips in a minute. And he loved all the people who worked for MAD and he didn't want to lose any of them. So as a result, for a long time, MAD was kind of a closed shop. Everybody in the country who thought they could be, do humorous illustration or write funny stuff submitted to MAD and they turned down 99% of all the artists. They turned down some of the most wonderful artists who ever lived. I don't know if I told you this story, but years ago in New York, I was with Mike Peters. Those, those of you who don't know Mike Peters, Mike was the uh, uh, the Pulitzer Prize winning uh, cart editorial cartoonist. And he did Mother Goose and Grimm. He won a Pulitzer Prize. He did not win a Nobel Prize. He won a Pulitzer Prize. And we met around to Nick Meglin. I said, oh, there's the uh, editor of Mad Magazine. And uh, he went, oh, I want to meet the editor of Mad Magazine. He introduced and, – and Mike Peters was just like Sergio was meeting Otto Saglau, speechless and, 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 and in full of love and gratitude and, and just excited, except that Mike was that way with everyone, and he still is. So he goes up and he meets Nick Meglin, the editor of Mad, and he hugs Nick, and he, and he says how much he loves Mad, and he loves everything, and – they, and we part, we take two steps away, and, and Mike turns to me, and he says, that was the guy when I took my work up to Mad Magazine who said I had no talent. <laughs> <laughs> but they turned down lots of people. Yeah. So you show up, and you stumble in. You were probably the eighth freelancer, uh, aspiring freelancer to walk in the door that day. And what happened at their offices? Well... I was with Mike Peters. No, I wasn't. No. <laughs> I have gone to many magazines showing them my cartoons. And in those times, as Mark said, they didn't like pantomime cartoons. They, the American tradition of humor, besides the comedians that do that, the, in paper, they are based from Punch magazine, from the British type of sense of humor. And that is a lot of words. All cartoons have always a line, rarely, except by some Europeans like Steinberg and other cartoonists, they will use cartoons without words. A lot of the editors, when I brought the, the, the cartoons, they will look around and say, where is the, where is the text? I said, well, it's no text. In some places, they put below the cartoon without words. So people will know it was a pantomime cartoon. So it was very difficult. So everybody look at my cartoons and says, these things are too crazy. You should go to MAD. But I was a fan of MAD. I, I grew up, the first time I saw MAD in high school, I went crazy by the drawings. I didn't understand English at all. And I went with my colleagues that spoke English and asked them to translate for me. And they couldn't because the English in MAD is not the English that you learn in school. I have a blue pen, you have a... So it was really hard for them to translate. But to me, the drawings were just amazing. 
And I knew through the years after I went also to college that their specialty was satire and and uh, making fun of television, making fun of movies. And I did pantomime gags, single cartoon gags. We was at, so every time they told me that, I said, I'm not going to go too mad because that is not what they do. But I, I was by then, I, I blew it up. I, uh, this is not for me. I'm going to go to mad, at least to meet some of the cartoonists because I'm a great admirer of their work. So I go to mad. And of course, again, I went blank and I didn't know what to say. And the first thing that came to my mind was Antonio Proias. Antonio Proias is a gentleman that drew Spy vs. Spy. And, and, you were, and, and, and you were able to read Spy vs. Spy. Very no easily. Okay. And, so, and let's, tell, let's tell people who Antonio was. Antonio had been a Cuban political cartoonist. And he was ordered, killed, possibly, by the Fidel Castro administration. And he fled Cuba. Right. Yes. 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 And, yes, yes. and and he was now living in New York, and yes. he was not at, he was not at Mad every day. You just were lucky that that particular day he happened to be in the office. There's That's a lot correct. of chance. There's a lot of chance involved in here. So so after all yeah. these freelancers are coming in, getting turned away, with great glee by Nick Megalin and Jerry DeFuccio, you walk in and you ask for Antonio Perez. He happens That's to correct. be there. Yes. He comes out That's and. Good. My brother, my brother from Mexico, how are you? He was the warmest person individual in the world. So we shot for a little while about Cuba, about Mexico, and about his problems over there, and how hard he was, but he was very fortunate that Matt had liked his work. So I, I all this in Spanish, of course, so I told him, please, can you introduce me to some of the editors so maybe they can look at my cartoons? I said, well, you have to introduce yourself, but I don't speak any English either. You know, so he went how, in. How, how, how is his Spanish? By then, it's still logical. Through the years, he forgot it because he didn't any, had anybody to practice it with. So by the end, he was like, hola, my brother, mi hermano, how are you? Very basic uh, communications. But he was a gentleman and a great guy. So. Jerry the Future comes out, uh, one of the editors at Mad, and I get introduced as my brother from Mexico. One of the things that Pro Ias knew how to do. So Mr. The Fuccio keep calling me Mr. Pro Ias because he thought I was really his brother from Mexico. And I can say, no, 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 my name is Aragonés. Well, mi nombre es Aragonés, but he didn't know that Aragonés is a name, so he keep calling Pro Ias. So I convinced him to look at my cartoon, so he took him in. And Antonio and I continued talking about everything, but my head was like, oh no, they, they, they're looking at my cartoons without me telling them what they were, because they were pantomime can do cut it out and total disorder. Okay. And then they come out, they come out, uh, Felstein, uh, and Me uh, Megli, which is, I met. Uh, Al, Fel Al, Al Felstein was the editor. Was the editor. And yes, then the Nick Megli and Jerry DeFusion were the associate editors. Correct. And uh, they asked me, do you sell them? <laughs> but, yes, of course. And I had done a lot of cartoons about astronauts in Mexico to show around and try to sell them, which nobody bought. So they took a few of them and said, we're going to buy two pages and put all these already published cartoons, not published, already drawn cartoons. And we're going to make a two page called A Mad Look at the United States space effort and i says that's wonderful you know and uh, so i was delighted that they bought it you know and they went back inside and they, with my cartoons and jerry stayed out and says uh you could bring some more ideas you know it's another article i uh, i see you have a couple of mo motorcycle gags so why don't you bring more gags about motorcycle cars and i said sure I went to the place I was staying. I work all night. And next morning, before they opened the office, I was standing at the door, standing with my portfolio there. And Jerry, who was the guy who opened the door, he comes and says, what, what, yes, what, what are you doing? He says, I brought the article that you wanted. Well, they couldn't believe that I had brought over 20 gags 
of motorcycle cops in one night. Of course, they went inside and they came out and they bought it immediately. They said, this is terrific. We got this one also. And they, they told me do mad ideas for covers. In a few days, I was there with a whole batch of ideas for covers and more I, for articles about uh, the football, another one. So they bought a lot of things. And then they told me, look, we have enough. Go back to Mexico. We have material here for months and months. So we don't need you anymore. And they gave me a, such a fat check that I have never seen so much money together then, you know. So it was just amazing. It was great. And that was the beginning. I never left. And I went to the office every day because I have made friends. They were my only friends. I didn't know anybody else. Tell tell Sergio, tell them about staying in the office. You stayed I in the office. To the, I will go to, to, to Bill and I will talk about one of the things, the first thing I asked about the cartoon is called uh, Walt, because I, did, I didn't remember his second name. And I says, well, Walt Disney. And says, no, 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 Walt something. And, and uh, they, he drew those beautiful little animals. The best. Oh, Walt Kelly. I says, yes. So he showed me a lot of material of his, but I wanted to see the mad. And so we went to the, to the, the big drawers and he opens them and showed me the original Al Jaffe and Maud Rocker. No, he did not show you original Al Jaffe. He showed uh, you. No, Robert you're right. He would. Because you're right, because he wasn't working then with Matt. Well, he, he, he had his, he started drawing regularly the same issue you did. Yes. Because Al had been writing for them and they didn't need more artists because, because like I said, Bill just didn't, he wanted like X number of pages of Drucker every month and Y number of pages of George Woodbridge and so. But what was happening was that Joe Orlando was cutting back working for them and Wally Wood was becoming a problem for them. So they were, for the first time in a long time, needed more artists. So they yes, converted but, Jeff, sorry, Jeff, yes. Sorry they converted, to interrupt you, yeah, yeah. but there was a full drawer set of the original Mad Work before when it was a comic book. Yes, and there, yes, and there was a lot of Jaffe material there. Yeah, that in the column, he was in the in the Kurtzman issues. Yes, he, he had all the originals. Yes, that's right. It was there. Do you remember the first time you took me to the Mad offices, which was in July of 1970? You took me back into the art department. You pulled out a drawer and you pulled out the original art to Mad Number One, the whole issue, and you put it in my hands and you said to me, "You may look at it, but you may not keep it." <laughs> and, I, and I said, if I had a gun, I could keep it. And I stood there for about 20 minutes looking at the original art of Mad Number. I have never seen more amazing artwork in my life. And this is a comic I loved and, and looked, you know, as a reader. Looked at, but to see Wally Wood's original artwork and Jack Davis's original artwork and John Severin's original artwork and Bill Elder's original artwork, it was amazing. Now, you stayed in the offices some nights to look at all that stuff. Well, that, that's what happened. I said, this is amazing. I wish I had the whole night to, to see it. So Jerry DeFuccio, who was a terrific guy and we have become friends, says, why don't you stay here? Well, why, why don't you go to your hotel or whatever? And says, I don't have a place to stay. You know, I I'm, I'm really don't have a place. I says, well, stay here all the night. We have a coffee machine over there. We have the bathroom, everything you need. And tomorrow morning, when we open the office, you get out of here. And it was a delight because now I could see all the cartoons in peace, read all issues of MAD, learning with a dictionary what a lot of the words were. And in the morning, I will sleep in, well, before I, when I was tired, I went to sleep in Bill Gaines office, which was the best sofa of all the other sofas. And I look at the, the other magazine that they did before MAD. That was uh, Panic. 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 Oh, that was amazing. They, they were simultaneous. Probably. Yeah, but that was an amazing magazine that I have never seen before with a word. It was really more wild than MAD. It was really well, fantastic. Panic was edited by Feldstein, and it was mostly written by Jack Mendelssohn. But yeah. he used the same artist Kurtzman was using in Mad, and Kurtzman didn't like that. But and he, you know, and he and he didn't like the fact that like they did the parody of Little Abner, so he couldn't do the parody of Little Abner. And oh, such. Yeah. It, but, but it was great times, great times. I, but, I, but this was like night in the museum. You were you were a night in the Mad offices. Totally. How, totally. how many how many times did you do that? How many times did you oh. sleep in the Mad offices? Uh, 
In offices? No. Well, the office. In yeah. office. At the yeah. office, that, that was uh, many times, many times. Okay. And uh, it was a, the greatest experience going through all the, the original material. And I would work there also. And then I leave and then I come back after I, I, uh, I showered. And uh, it was a fascinating time. Then I, I got a place because by now I have money. And uh, so that, that changed the whole thing. And uh, so, but that, that, that experience to me, and I don't think any other company will have been so generous and friendly to allow me to stay over there. And they, and then what happened is that the margin, the marginal started, you know. Yeah. Uh, we, uh, before we go further, we have another friend online with us. Look who we just got a message from, Sergio. Tom Luth. Tom Luth. The, the best colorist in the world. He is a blessed man because the pages of Guru are worth like three or four pages of normal comics. In every <laughs> normal comic, you have two headshots, two mid shots, a guy hitting the other guy and the other guy hitting the guy and then two headshots and that's it you have to color that and you get paid the same to tom tom has to first page is a crowded scene the second one is another crowded scene and he he must get my pages and go oh no not another one but he's a, he's a fantastic colorist and a great friend and a very patient man and uh He's been a, a team worker like nobody as well. Of course, Stan Sakai. Yes. And, uh, but uh, it's been a, a great, great collaboration and uh, a great friend. Yes, yes, yes. As Trevor, oh, <laughs> as Trevor Kimball says, Tom earns his money on Gru. Yes. yes. But he Good. should earn more. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> he, got, he gets paid, unlike some of us. <clears throat> All right. So now you got to meet all the mad guys. Did they? Did you feel instantly accepted by all the art writers? Not really. Uh, uh, a lot of people didn't know what to do with me because I didn't understand things. I remember Jaffe by then when he was working there. I, they were telling jokes. We went to mad trips and everything. And I would tell Jaffe a joke for him to tell it for me because I'm a very bad joke teller in person you know I, I go direct to the point because i'm a cartoonist and i don't i don't elaborate on it so he would look at me like you really want me to tell this dumb joke <laughs> because it was so bad so he will have an expression that no Sergio, i cannot do that give me a better one you know but we had we developed a very good friendship from day one he was a great he still is a great gentleman and a great friend He's 99 years old and still as sharp as, as he can be. But we, he had been my roommate in many of the mad trips. He's been just a sensational friend. And he's sharp as a tack. And probably if they ask me, Sergio, who's mad? Who's a madman? It's Al Jaffe. He's done every type of article, masses, articles, puzzles. He is mad. He's a mad, mad person. Okay. More than any other cartoons. I, I was going to say, take all the questions at the end, but all of a sudden, several people have all asked us, Sergio, do you have any memories of Don Martin? Yes, of course. We became friends uh, from the beginning. He was living in New Jersey. And uh, I like his work because he was mostly pantomime and crazy. But he was a very quiet guy. He was not a, a very talky guy. He was a very pause um gentleman he like, like you know once in a while but very very calm down very very nice and uh we develop a, a good friendship we talk a lot about the cartoon end of it why he he was a illustrator who wanted to do posters and illustrate books in his style and sometimes being working for MAD closes you other doors because they think that you do this zany, gag, broad humor, which is not true. Some of it, it's very subtle and very well done and very well crafted, better than any any other places. And uh, he, that's what he wanted more than just be just a cartoonist. 
he wanted to illustrate a lot. So we talk about a lot about the differences between cartooning, humorous illustration, illustration, and all kinds of things. And we had a very good time. I visit him, and even many years later, after many of the mad trips, which I went to visit him in Florida a few times. We went canoeing on the Everglades. He had a canoe and rented one for me, and we went canoeing all over the place. He was a terrific friend and very quiet and uh, conflicted in a sense because of what he wanted to do more than just make little gags one by one. He wanted the illustration of us as a medium. You know? But he was a terrific guy, terrific guy. Uh, Mark Drucker once said to me that for a number of years, people were turning him down for advertising work, and they'd say, it looks like Mad Magazine. And then after a <laughs> while, people were calling him saying, we'd like you to do advertising work. Can you make it look like Mad Magazine? <laughs> it became popular that way. We have a yeah. question here. Theodore Spence has a question I think you'd probably like to answer. Was Bill Gaines loved, feared, loathed, or just a jovial caricature of his persona in Mad? No, Bill was loved, feared, loathed. And just the jovial caricature of his person in mad, you know. It, he was everything. He was loved, no doubt about it. And at the same time, fear never. There, there was never a fear. He he was a, a friend, but he was also a businessman, and he had a tradition that had to be done that way. He was a, a chemical a chemical teacher. He, and he knew a lot about math. And he wanted everything to be by the book, exactly as it should be. I mean, the guy could invite you a lot of people. Oh, he's cheap. Not really. He invited us to trips that spent a lot of money, which they were deductible. He, he will invite you to a dinner and didn't think about the price. You could order the best things and the bottles of wine that he will order they were the best, but he will go to the penny to pay his telephone bill at the office. And then he'll go, because many times I work at the office there with Antonio Proyas, who was also sitting there. And there was always a desk for artists who work at the office. He will go and say, who called you Jersey? And then Jerry would say, the, I did. He says, you owe me 65, 65 cents. And he will really mean it. He needed that 65 cents because like this, he could match everything to the, to the dot. Then he will argue with the cleaning people because they, they raised the price or something and he didn't thought it was price. So for months, the office was a mess until they solved a problem. So he was a little of everything. He was a very, he thought about the math. He wouldn't interfere with it. He will wait until the issue was done. And then he laughed his head off because Felstein, Gain, uh, 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 Dick, uh, Nick Beglin, and and uh, and Proyas, they will prepare everything. And the art, uh, art editor John Putnam, who was a fantastic man too, and Lenny Brenner, who was the assistant. That was the whole staff at the secretary, and that was it. And then they will present the magazine to him, and he will laugh and love it because it's exactly what he wanted for it. And then he will take care of business. Feldstein said that maybe five or six times in his whole time editing Mad, Gaines asked him to change something for reasons of legalities or taste. He thought something was a yeah. cheap shot or something. But very rarely, he would just yeah. love reading Mad. Let's. We got a, a message here. Read this one here, Sergio, for us. Juan Carlos, uh, uh, hola Juan. <laughs> I was lucky to work close to the back in the uh, bibliography book. Sergio Antes de Lagunes was published here in Mexico. Great memories. Uh, he says that, oh, it's in English, of course. English, yes. <laughs> well, he and, and other colleagues from Mexico, they did a great book about it. It's called Sergio Antes de Aragonés, who means Sergio before Aragonés. It's everything that happened to me in Mexico. Growing up there, growing, even from uh, photos from Spain, France, Mexico, and my career as a cartoonist in Mexico, and cartoons that I published over there, my life as a, a aquatic ballet swimmer, uh, every, anecdotes related to my life in Mexico. And uh, it was published in Spanish. They are trying to sell it in English. Uh, it is hard because it's uh, very personal. I, did, I don't know. Uh, but he's, uh, he's a very good writer. 
Juan Carlos, very glad to hear you. Thank you to, for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Okay, so now uh, you were you. We we never really got to the story of how you started doing the marginals. Ah, all right. I when I read Mad, there was always a little note on the borders that I didn't understand. So I would go to Jerry and says, Jerry, what does this mean? And he says, Well, ha, ha, have you read the Taming the Shrew? No. Well, then you won't understand this joke. And then there was another one, and and this one he says, Have you seen? Uh, the pawnbroker, the yeah, abbot, I don't get it. Oh, well, you won't understand it because this is a, a play on the word. So I, I was thinking, well, many other people, maybe they don't understand this thing. So I can fill it up with cartoons. They have no, have no words, and I can make them small. And so I got the idea. I draw them on the same size, you know, the little cartoons, then cut them up and paste them up on the magazine in top of that. Things. And then I pretended. Let, let me explain that, that that be prior to Sergio coming along, every issue of Mad had a thing called marginal thinking, and they would put these little text gags in between panels or in the margins, or to, so that after you read Mad, you'd go back through. And Nick Maglin and Jerry DeFuccio wrote them, mostly Nick, I think. And no, uh, Jerry worked a lot of them. Yeah. Anyway, and they they. Um, so the mad, the idea of mad at that time was to just cram it so full of stuff. You'd read the magazine, then you'd go through and read it again and see all the stuff you missed the first time, and you'd go through it again and see all the stuff. The first issue of Mad I read was number seventy. That was a couple of issues before you came in, and I just it took me. I spent hours reading it, just looking at every little gag in the backgrounds and things like that. It was a wonderful. Uh, in fact, I loved that issue so much. Mad number seventy. I started hitting second-hand bookshops, and by the time number 71 came out, I had found all the pre-number pre 70 magazine issues of MAD. MAD number 70 was my first issue, and by the time 71 came out, I had a complete collection of all the magazines. I love that so much. All right, so now you you pasted these little drawings in the margins, and you showed them to Jerry, and you showed them to Nick. And they yeah. probably loved it because they no, said I, I, I went direct to 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 Felstein. Oh, okay. And and uh, he couldn't find him. He said, "Look, look!" And he would look at the magazine. And say, what I have to look? He was getting really mad, you know. So I I pointed at the at the drawing, and then he looked at it. Then he called uh, Nick and uh, Jerry, you know, and told. And so I waited outside because I didn't want to hear any any. Every time they look at my articles, I waited outside because it's it's the correct thing to do. I mean, let them say whatever they want without you being there. So I waited outside, and they said that's terrific. You know, uh, prepare for the next issue. And, wow, you know that that was like for me a permanent job for mad. You know, and. Later, many years later, I found out that Felsin says, well, these are very good, but I don't think anybody can do that many cartoons without words at that size. But let's, let's run it until he runs out of ideas. And so far, I'm still doing them. You know? So it's, just, it's been very good. But you missed one issue. There's one issue yes. without marginal, yes. your marginal cartoons. Yes. I By then, I was married and was doing pretty good because Matt paid excellently well. And uh, so I figured out that it was the time for me to go to Europe and meet my idols from Europe, my cartoonist people that I love over there, and meet my family in Spain, which I have never met, and, and spend a few years over there, which at the end I spent two and a half years uh, traveling. But so I figured out how can I do it by work? And I, what happened in the beginning is that Lenny Brenner, the art director, will take, uh, give me the sizes where they were going to put the marginals. And I will draw them and they will paste them on the artwork on that size. That was before computers. So I have to, and I figured out, well, I have to find sort of like a common denominator so I can send them from Europe. And I realized that all the marginals are this size, exactly. You know, this is exactly the size. 
So I, after I measure them, all of them, who are drawn twice and a half up, so they can reduce. So I tell them that I was going to mail them from Europe. And my big mistake is that I didn't calculate that difference of time to send from Europe to the States. So it arrived late a few days, and I missed that issue. You remember what issue was, Mark? No, I don't. I don't. The fun, the, real, the, real, the real funny one, I remember. No, it's, it's yeah. I don't remember. <laughs> so uh, I missed one issue, one issue. OK. Um, now, uh, while you were working for MAD, you started working for DC Comics. Yes. That happened that when I arrived from Europe, I went immediately to MAD, and said hello to everybody, and I asked for Joe Orlando, who was a good friend of mine. And I, he had been a cartoonist, but I said, well, he doesn't work at MAD anymore. He says, well, come. He, he's a friend of Bill Gaines since, since they were very young. I mean, how come? He says, well, you know that uh, uh, Gloria. Wife, Gloria, Gloria is is uh, is Bill's secretary, and then he figured out that it would be a conflict having both of them, so he had to get rid of one of them, and he needed Gloria more than he needed choices. They got divorced, and he and he felt they couldn't both work for the same company for because there was bad blood or something Correct. problem. So so so, so he so, kept uh, he kept. Uh, Gloria. Yeah. And Joe went yeah. to work as an editor for DC Comics. Yes. And he brought and you so in there. When I, I, I arrived to the office the first day, I have uh, just came from Europe and I go there and he's with, um, um, I do know the name, the guy who, uh, Italian fellow who did all the inking. Uh, Nick Cardi. Uh, Nick Cardi. Uh, yeah. no, 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 no. Uh, Vince Coletta. Vince uh, Coletta. Yeah. And he's there. Ah, hello, Miss Coletta, very glad. He says, we were waiting for the writer to bring a couple of stories for a comic called Young Romance. And uh, he, Vince came all the way, and now he's, and, and I figured it out, well, I can do that. So I said, why don't you take Vince for lunch? And when you come back, I'll give you the, the two stories that you need for Young Romance. I said, terrific. So they left. I went to the library, the, the <laughs> DC library, took the, the volume of the collected uh, Young Romance, who, by the way, was uh, created by uh, Jack Kirby. And Joe Simon and Jack Kirby, yes. 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 So yes. I look at the stories, and I realize that all of them were exactly the same. Girl meets boy, boy separate of girl. Girls cry because they're getting boy, and then the boy calls, and they, they are together again. So all that's easy. So I wrote the story of how I met my first wife and then how a friend of mine met his wife. And I drew it because I don't type or, or write English normally. So I do like a storyboard with a story with a very basic dialogue for the editors to correct it. And then I gave him two stories and he looked at them and says, terrific. So he gave them to, to, to Vince and they left. You know, and, they then, and, then, and then you did stuff. And, my beginning. and you did stories, uh, gag pages for House of Mystery. You did yeah, uh, stories. I, I wrote House of Mystery too. Yeah, you you do you worked did some stuff for Inferior Five, Angel and the Ape, Jerry. I think you Bob Hobart, Jerry, Jerry Lewis, Lewis, Jerry Lewis yeah. comics, and you Inferior did Inferior Five, yeah. Inferior Five, and eventually Batlash. Yes, which was one of the a great comic that that I think did not have a, enough chance to show itself before they canceled it. I thought it was well, I thought it was one of these comics which if they had kept it going, it would have caught on big. Yeah, but it didn't have enough sales in those times. No, nothing. It, it only so. It only sold seventy thousand copies. You know. Today they so, kill for seventy thousand copies. That's correct. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, but, but then there was law. Yeah. Anyway, well, it, you got to So you started working for them, and We're, then working that, and I continued working for Mad, and then for for Mad, I for DC I did Plop, which was a lot of fun yes. with humor, and uh, yes, I, I did a, a lot yeah. of. Uh, so. Yeah. By the way, I have had a vision here. I've remembered that the issue of Mad that you missed was number one eleven. I said that that suddenly popped into my brain. <laughs> thanks to Gary Grossman. All right, thank you, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Gary Grossman is a gentleman who is a, not only a very good friend, is a fan of Gru and knows everything about Gru. He yes. will tell you and about Mad a lot, but Gru many times I'm drawing, and I will have to ask you. In what issue we had a guy with a cane sitting a little old lady, and he goes, 
issue 25, page 24, panel five. And just boom, he knows everything. So he's a, a gray brain, gray brain. Okay. Now we got we I want to we can't go forever on this thing. Let's jump to uh, when you were you were living in Los Angeles for, after a while. You and I hung out together and became friends and did things. You were writing for television. You were working with George Slatter on the new Laugh In. You were yes. working with George Slatter on a show called Speak Up America. Yeah. You worked for Dick Clark on the Bloopers and Practical Joke shows. Yeah. You worked on a you worked on a show for Dick Clark called uh, the Half Hour Comedy Hour, which I was a writer on, and we brought you in yeah. and had you do some of the animation yeah. on that yeah. show. Um, uh, you know, you, you did all this stuff. And then, and you also appeared in a few movies, like yeah. Norman and Matt You, and uh, what was the one, uh, To Kill a Legend? Stranger. To Kill a Stranger. To Kill a Stranger, that's right, yes. And you played a generalissimo. Like a that. bad guy, yeah. Yes, well, who, who did bad things and killed Marty Feldman. No, <laughs> that's right. Okay, all right. No, we don't no, have that, no. we don't have time for that story here. All right, and then at some point you started doodling a character, a stupid barbarian character, named yeah. uh, Gru. Gru the Wanderer. Yes. Anyway, mm -hmm. yeah, it's called name. Gary told me that also. All right. Do, do so, some, uh, uh, some oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> sorry, sorry. So, so you were doodling. You were showing me drawings of Gru on George Schlatter's stationery. You were trying filling. This is this is why the show went over budget. You were filling all of his stationery with drawings of Gru and doodles of him, and you did a couple of stories. Well, can I tell yeah. the story? Sure. Or you want to tell it? No, no, you tell it. Uh, okay. I was in Europe, and I realized that in the United States there were no humor comics at all. They had children comics, they have funny animal comics, they have teenager comics, but in humor, humor, there was no comics about it. And I realized in Europe, the majority of comics besides the Western that they, they were humorous. And says, I love comics, I wanna do a comic about it. And what, is that me? No. no, that was me, that was me. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, so while I was walking in front, I thought I have to do a, 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 a comic. So I, I was thinking on the street, walking, and it occurred to me to do a funny story about a stupid Tarzan brother. He was a twin. The parents died, and there was a Tarzan and a brother. And the brother was stupid because he wasn't raised by the monkeys. He was raised by something else. And I thought, what a great idea. So I'm walking on the street. And I passed a movie house, and there was a sign, Tarzan, the stupid Tarzan brother, by a French cartoonist. They already had an animation movie about it. So I start thinking, what is a miss on the comic genre in, in Europe? And, and barbarians weren't that popular, so I start thinking about it. I'm talking in the 60s. Late sixties, me hold on. Sergio, hold on. Keep tell, telling this story. I'm going to put you full screen here. I've got a this this call could be an emergency. Hold on. Let's go okay. ahead. Okay. All right. Uh, so now that he's not here, let's take, talk bad about Mark. No. The the thing is that I I start thinking about Guru, trying to create a character. I did a few pages, and I I figured out I had it made. I I, I don't have to draw buildings or cars or anything modern. I will draw fantasy and dragons and witches and everything. So I thought I had the, 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 the concept pretty well established. So I went to different companies saying that I would like to do a comic book, but I went all, all the rights. Sure, and sure. all of them says, no way. There's no way that you can own the rights. The company's on the right. But I wanted them because in Europe, all the cartoonists own the rights of their own product. Moebius, uh, uh, Looky Look, every character owns their own material. So it took me all the way, creating the character all the way to the 70s, all the way to 1983 to find a publisher that will allow me to publish a comic being the author and keeping the copyrights, which took so long. And uh, 
So we went to a company. I, the first thing I did when they, they, uh, the, 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 the company who was doing it was called, uh, Pacific Comics, right? Well, yeah, first we had Destroyer Duck. Yeah, well, I was going to go to that. Okay. That I, the first thing I asked, uh, about that, that if I, oh, yeah, the, he's right. The first thing we did is he asked me to do a, a page for the comic that he was planning. He did mostly all the work on that. For uh, explain that that you are you are both okay. familiar well, with. Well, okay. The, the the significant thing about Gru and when the sale of Gru happened is this: I got into comics in 1970, and I worked with a man you may have heard of named Jack Kirby, and. Jack was the most successful guy in comics, and he still wasn't making very much money. And he didn't get a guaranteed credit on his work. He didn't get royalties, didn't get residuals. And one of the most memorable things in my life is that I sat with Jack in a meeting with the brass of DC Comics at one point, and Jack said, here's how the comic book industry has to change. You got to start paying royalties. You got to start paying residuals. You've got to start returning original art. You've got to give us some creative control. He named about 18 things that had to be done to better the lot of writers and artists and give them a little more control of their work and give them some remuneration when it was reprinted and reused and used in other media. And as we sat there, the DC Comics Brass said, no, we can never do that. It's not legal. We can't do that. We can't give you the originals back. We cannot give you a copyright. We cannot. Every single thing that he told them had to happen, they said, we will never do that. We can't do that. The lawyers would forbid that. The law forbids that. We cannot do those. Don't you understand? That cannot be done. And every one of those things has since come to pass in comics. And a yeah. major breakthrough was that they agreed to publish, that somebody in publishing comic books agreed to publish, grew the wanderer with the words copyright Sergio Aragonis in it. And something some people don't know about Gru is that from the start, we have retained complete creative control of it. They're not allowed to change anything in the book. They almost never do, but if they did, they'd have to call. They actually once called me and said, we have these two characters, Pal and Drum, and Sergio forgot to draw the, the facial hair on one of them. And they said, can we add a mustache to this guy so he matches the other panel? And that was the only thing we ever let them do in 120 issues at Marvel was draw the mustache. And, and I think yeah. one time you forgot the spot under Roferto's eye. That uh, happened but a it, lot. Anyway, that's, so, that's his main job is to put so, the black so eye. In. One of the many things I am proud of to be involved with Gru the Wanderer is that it did every single thing that they told Jack Kirby could not be done. And it broke through all sorts of taboos and, and they weren't they were not cases where no, no, that's not legal to do. No, we can't do it. It was just we don't want to do that. And they, they couched it in these these alibis. So a friend of ours named Steve Gerber was suing Marvel over this character of his destroyer duck, as this, uh, Howard the Duck. And somebody got together and said, let's produce a benefit comic book to raise some money for Steve's lawsuit because Steve was taking on a giant corporation, and giant corporations can outspend you. They can spend, you know... Uh, you know, a hundred thousand dollars for every dollar you can spend, and eventually you drop the lawsuit because you're you're just going too deep into the red on, on legal fees. So, Jack Kirby agreed to draw the lead story for nothing. Alfredo Alcala agreed to ink it for nothing, and we went to various people: Sherry Flanagan and Joe Staten and Scott Shaw and Marty Pasco, and I'm blanking on everybody else who was in that book. Nobody got paid. We put it together, and I went to Sergio, and I said, you remember that two-page Gru story you have? Uh, was it, it was, was two pages, or was it four? It was in the first... Four or five. Four or four. Anyway, he had this... It was all pantomime. It was a, the only completed Gru story he'd done at that moment. And I said, is there any way we could publish that? And he just grabbed it and handed it to me and said, here, put it in the book. Put it in the book. And we ran it, and people loved it. And the next thing we know, um, we're talking to Pacific Comics <laughs> about doing a regular group comic. And when Pacific Comics got in trouble, Marvel wanted the book. And when Marvel Comics started, their Olympic line started falling apart, probably because of us, we sank all these companies. Yeah, yeah. Um, it went to Image Comics, and now it's a dark horse. And and when we and finally put them, Eclipse. You know, Eclipse did one issue uh, because we had, material. A, well, we had a, well, Eclipse had an issue that was done for Pacific. Pacific couldn't, um, 
uh, oh. run it because they were going out of business, but it had already been formatted for printing in a format that Marvel couldn't use, so Marvel couldn't print it. So I took it to Eclipse, and they printed that one issue. Uh, and then they had a flood, which wiped out the part of their company. So it's a jinx. It's 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 uh, everybody suffers if they publish Gru. It's very sad. <laughs> no, no, deep, no. deep down, we're all Captain Ahex, being having our ship yeah. sunk by the guy. Yeah, 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 so yeah. anyway, so we've been doing Gru now forever. And um, anyway, um, uh, let's talk about Gru. Um, are you sick of it yet? No, 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 no. I'm having a great time. We we did uh, the last article was a, a crossover. We did a crossover with uh, with uh, uh, Tarzan, no, with uh, Conan, Conan, with a great uh, uh, artist who draws uh, the Prince Valiant on, on the comic strips. Uh, Tom Tom, Yates. Thomas Yates. Yeah, Thomas, Thomas Yates. Thomas Yates, and yeah. he's very good. But he's a very good artist, and very good artist takes time to do their work. Because a hand has to look like a hand. Uh, Gru hand is, is like a sausage, you know, so it doesn't make a difference. But it took too long time. And meanwhile, we have done the work for another series called Gods Against Gru, which is the continuation of the Fry of the Gods and the Play of the Gods, who are eight issues. So we are doing another four issues to complete the 12 issues so it'll be put in a book form so i've finished two issues already and uh i'm working and we're working on the third and fourth and uh the, 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 that, that that horse has been very generous so we are paid as we work so everything in that sense hasn't changed that much for us and i'm very fortunate that i'm still working for mad and uh they also paid, so I'm not doing that much of a difference, except I miss my friends, I miss all the colleagues that I meet at the conventions, and uh, it's sad. But my daughter and her husband take care of, of us, Charlene, my wife, and I, and we're doing uh, pretty good, pretty good. Yeah. Okay, we're going to uh, throw this open for questions. Uh, if you want to ask, answer a question, ask Sergio a question, we will. Uh, uh, I'll try to get to some of them. Uh, we have a, we have a, several people have asked the question of: Are we going to put the Gru figures out again, or the Gru game, or um, those things are all talked about? We never seem to quite get to them. Uh, the, the big question, of course, is: Will we ever have a, a big collection of all of Gru in hardcovers? Uh, the complete Gru run of hardcovers. And yeah, you'll see that. We just don't have a deal in place right now where we're happy. Yes. We've yes. turned down a few things because we're kind of fussy with how it's done and how much they want to charge our fans to buy it. So um, uh, let's see if we got any other questions here. Well, uh, the, the only thing we ask of everybody is a little patience because it will be done. Okay, that, yes. That's basically it. Um, Mark, uh, uh, Jerry Gilligan. Mark and Sergio, Gilligan. long time. Gilligan. Gilligan, yes. Jerry I'll, Gilligan. Bet, I'll bet he's never heard any jokes. Let long-time reader, first-time caller, have there ever been any offers to turn Gru into an animated series or movie? Yes, plenty of them. And the same thing we just said about the hardcover book supply. We haven't found exactly the right thing yet. Uh, yeah. we, we come very close. Uh, there have been arcs done, scripts written. Um, we had some directors. We had some talk with stars. Um, did you remember, do you remember what we, who we, pro, we promised a role in the Gru movie? Sergio, do you remember, remember when we were in that delicatessen and Harvey Corman was next to us? <laughs> yeah, he was on the other. We were, we, were in Nate Nell's, we were in Nate and Nell's delicatessen in Beverly Hills. just went out of business about a month <laughs> ago. Great delicatessen, full of stars. And we're sitting there with a major motion picture director and the, his agent. And we're talking about a potential Gru movie. This this was the guy who wanted to start. I'll tell you how long ago this was. He wanted to start Chris Farley as Gru. That was the, and he said one of the things, one of the reasons that Chris Farley would like to play Gru is he likes to pee outdoors. He would love to do a movie all outdoors so he can pee outdoors. Wow. So, Chris Farley. Know. Anyway, so hmm. Harvey Corman, who you all know from the Blazing Saddles and the Carol Burnett show, was sitting in the booth next to us, and it at. At Nate and Al's, they have little partitions between you. You're practically in the next booth with the other person. And Harvey Corman is leaning across the booth like this, 
listening and going, that's a good idea. Yeah, you should guys should make sure you put that. In. You should have a duck in this movie. And he starts giving us ideas about this movie, having no idea what it was. And we finally promised him a part in it if he'd leave us alone. And he went, "Okay, fine." And do you, do you remember this? Do you remember this, Sergio? Yeah. Anyway. Very clearly, very clearly. So, so, uh, so, if we do a Gru movie, we have to put Harvey Corbin in it, despite the fact that he's dead. So, anyway. Yeah, well. uh, uh, and Jerry Gilligan asks, who would do the, the voice for Gru? Uh, what does Gru sound like to you guys? This we've been debating for a long time, what Gru sounds like. Yeah. Uh, and and we, will, we will fight that to the death. We did a little test animation of Gru once, and we had Gru's voice done by Frank Welker for that. Um, and and Roberto's was done by Howard Morris, but it was never finished. That whole project fell through. But um, we don't. Uh, the answer is we don't know. Um, well, I I like the voice of Aldo Ray. <laughs> okay, we'll, Aldo Ray? Yes, we'll that, see if we can that find him. Be... No, <laughs> that's <laughs> right. Yes, we no Okay, God, but, uh, okay. But, uh, all yeah, right, that type of voice. Yes. Okay. Um, Steve he, Abramson. he won't have an accent. He won't have an accent. Yeah. Because to me, Gru speaks without accent. He speaks Spanish to me. You know. So. Yeah. Steve Abramson wants to know, Sergio, what which do you enjoy doing more, marginals or a full mad look at features? Uh, well, that's a great a great question because it's almost in three parts. Before you draw anything, you have to think about it. So, when they talk about writer's block. If you're writing a novel, only a novel the whole year, and you are, have a trouble getting a, 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 a segment or a phrase or something, you get a block. We, we don't get that block because if we if I'm writing and I, I don't know what is going, I, I switch to draw. And if I'm drawing and it takes too much trouble, I go back to writing. Same thing with a mad look at because it's a... It is fun to think jokes about something, but not too many. I could never do a comic strip. I will be terrified if I had to do like peanuts or something that every day I have to write only about certain characters forever until the thing. But the advantage with both of the pieces is they don't have anything to do with each other. What I enjoy the most, my original career is my, my Ma magazine cartooning without words like the marginal i enjoy enormously writing the mad looks at i enjoy it a lot because i have to think of a situation that has to change a subject uh, about musicals or about motorcycles or about cartoon anything and that's also very enjoyable i grew is enormously enjoyable because it changes so much and i have the system and help with Mark, who, without him, there wouldn't be no group. You know, I mean, all the words that you see there, the cheese dip is his idea. <laughs> the, uh, I wanted a word for, for Gru to be called, and I couldn't think of it. Mark came with Bendicant. And many times, they, they think, Sergio, that was a great pantomime idea that you have with Gru doing that thinking the whole page is he's thinking what to do. I didn't think that, Mark did. So it is a, a work that after the, the initial concept that we talk a lot about together, uh, we said we used to see it more often when we live closely, uh, but and we were doing the comic every month. He had sometimes ideas that I said, that's terrific, take care of it. He will write the whole thing. For instance, one of the best comics we had is when Ruferto became human and then he became a dog. That was all Marx. I, we were working in another project, and, says, and he did it, the, the whole writing. It was perfect. The graphic novels, they are totally Marx. We, we, he consults things for continuity and stuff. But without Marx, uh, Gru will be just a, a pantomime barbarian. <laughs> we, we do. We sometimes do not. Sergio and I have been doing this book, and we have had almost no fights. I think the longest one lasted about four minutes, two minutes, and and we both gave in. And uh, but we disagree often about who came up with which idea. I always think he came up with it, and he thinks I came up with it. There's a famous story: the great playwright George S. Kaufman collaborated with a lot of lesser-known 
uh, collaborators, and one of them was for a time a man named Moss Hart, who later became just as famous. And all the reviews would talk about, oh, the funny gags are George Kaufman, the lot bad ones must be this kid, Moss Hart. And someone asked Kaufman, which jokes are yours and which ones are Hart's? And he said, read the reviews, and anytime they say this joke is obviously George S. Kaufman, that was Moss Hart. Because <laughs> people can't can't tell the difference because we sometimes don't know. And yeah. sometimes and sometimes like one dish time I went to Sergio, we were having lunch at the Sizzler restaurant where some of the best ideas for Gru came up, you know, with stains of Malibu chicken on them. And I said to him, there's a guy whose name is Gru, G-R-U. He's an ambassador of peace wherever he goes. And Sergio goes, I've got it. And that was all he needed. He went home and wrote the exact same story I had in mind just based on that. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, you know, so who so who came up with that idea? It's hard to hard to say. Um, uh, Ty Tyler Sticker. Any chance of your mad paperback cartoons being reprinted? My copy of In Mad We Trust is getting pretty dog-eared. you got to get your mad paperbacks back in print. Yes, uh, I, I owe that copyright of those cartoons because they were never published in the magazine. All the pocketbooks were original material. And I make a, bill, a deal with Bill Gaines that I was paying him a percentage of my earnings for the use of the, letter, the logo MAD. Because a book with a logo mad is going to be sell much better than a Sergio Aragones cartoon without knowing who the guy is and when we started. So I pay bills. So the right of mine, and yes, there's a couple of uh, people interested to doing it. And, uh, and to tell you the truth is I've been so busy doing so much stuff that I really haven't had time to do a lot of reprints. I have probably close to 100 books published. And you cannot find almost none of them on print. Why? Because the the system works like that. You 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 print so many copies, and then the second order cannot fulfill that much, so they run out of print. You know, so okay. all, it, all then you, it will be done. It'll be, be done. All you folks out there in chat, you should feel honored. In your presence is a Disney legend. We have Floyd Norman. Where's ah. Floyd? There's Floyd there. This Floyd's online. Anyway, thank you for joining us, Floyd. Um, and then somebody asked me, there's an urban urban legend that Danny DeVito was going to play Gru. Not one we ever heard. I never heard of that. Um, uh, anyway. The, the character Gru is not that important. It's all the action and all the people around him that does the comic. Gru yeah. is sort of like a, a catalyst for the actions that happen around him. He just enter and screws up everything, no matter what, for the good guys or the bad guys. But mostly, he represents the the ugliness of a lot of people trying to do wrong, and they get screwed up. Sometimes the good people get screwed up because good to screw up. But it, it is. I know that you can get very good money doing a movie about Gru, but I would like it to be an animated movie because. I saw a movie called The Flintstones, and just the thought of somebody dressed like Gru, and I've seen a lot of them in the conventions. Yeah. It doesn't appeal to me whatsoever. Yeah. Or all. Nothing. Yeah. But I don't know. Okay. Uh, so there's a beginning writer here online, Sergio. Maybe you heard of him. His name is uh, Dick D. Bart. Tolo. Oh my uh, God, my dear friend. Let me give you a, a few miles. Hello. Oh yeah, yeah. You're, you're messing up. You're the mess best writers. The best you're, writers in, in Mad. Uh, you're just jealous. Have, you're just jealous that Dick has a more impressive mustache than you do. So. Yeah, but I have more hair here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, Dick Bartolo. It, it's a terrific guy. A great writer. And a good friend because we've been together in a, and he had a great book about mad also that uh, they, you if you look in the computer look for his book because he is a, has a great great stories on it and it has great illustrations of course but he's a great friend and we had the greatest times of the on the trips because we we fake falls we did all kinds of things no no he's a, an amazing person and uh 
It's terrific. Yeah. Uh, Hello. It Here's a question we, I don't think I've ever seen. Would you consider Gru as a film performed by Muppet style puppets? No. Yeah, if you can get a thousand puppets <laughs> on the back and get their fingers caught by Gru's sword. So, ah, the people, oh, no, Gru just, I was manipulating an enemy of Gru. And, no, 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 no. It, it's cute, but uh, uh, hi, Dale. I know Dale too. Okay. Um, let me see. Well, anybody else got more questions here before we get out of here? Uh, Dick reminds us his book was called uh, "Oh Good Days," and, and he said, "Oh God, Serge and I would do fake fights." Yes. Yes. <laughs> All good days and mad. Yes. Yeah. Look for it. It's good. Good book. Yeah. Good book. Uh, Lord Metal Demon. That's probably his real name. Question: Now that you have done Gru versus Conan, will we ever see Gru versus Usagi? I doubt it very much, but uh, we do in Gru versus Tarzan, and, and that's done and, already. Yeah, and, and 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 Sergio and I have agreed that that's our last crossover for a while. It was it, it we don't. Uh, those are tough to do. Those were very tough to do. Those, they those take too long, back and forth. Yeah. We 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 want to continue, and we will as soon as we finish the series. Uh, of uh, the gods against Gru, we still in negotiation try to do Gru every month. Yes, like yeah, we Gru did before. Yeah, M monthly Gru was about to come back, but then the comic book industry went away on us. And but it is back. It, it is different. Times changes, and uh, maybe it will be on the computer. W one thing I I don't particularly care very much is that. If everybody has a little telephone like that and they want to look at Gru there, they go to miss everything because Gru is drawn for for detail, you know. And uh, you'll miss you'll miss a lot. Okay, Trevor Kimball, Sergio, at Mark's quick draw panels, do you have a picture in your head before you start, or you just start drawing and build the image as you go somewhere in between? Well, no, I don't have any idea because Mark. Uh, doesn't want to tell us anything. But what I do is I want to think about what he just said, and I go and pretend I'm stupid. And I go, uh, what do you say, Mark? Oh, I <laughs> thought you said uh, Superman. Didn't you say Superman? Meanwhile, my head is going blah, 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 creating the, the cartoon that I'm going to draw. By then, I have the idea, of course. But no, no, nothing gets prepared. Nothing. I've, I've, totally I've been watching tennis. I've been watching Sergio long enough to notice a certain look on him when he, when he gets the idea. One time I gave them, the, the cartoonists, the job of drawing themselves as Batman. So Sergio started drawing himself as Batman, and I could see on his face he was trying to find the gag, and all of a sudden I saw his face light up, and he started drawing pens on the utility belt. That was the joke. The Batman's the, the Sergio Batman has a utility belt of pens to draw with. So, he was so, me. Yes. Anyway, I, I I saw the look on his face, and I go, "Okay, he's got the gag. Let's see what it is." So anyway, um, we got time for like one or two more here. Um, let me see who else in uh, um, uh, Sergio. What's the cruelest or most challenging thing Mark has had you quick draw? Well, first he wants to get paid. That's oh no, no, no! What, what have I asked you to do? In what have I asked you to do in um, in uh, uh, quick draw that you that was really challenging. What was the toughest assignment I gave you? Oh well, there's a there's a couple. One, if he catches me out of guard, is that he asked me to draw, let's say, a gorilla. So I draw a gorilla, and then he says, "Well, do a gorilla uh, uh, um, uh, riding an elephant." And then he asked me to. Uh, meanwhile, the owner of the elephant is running, trying to hit, the, and he start adding things into the drawing which I have less and less space. And then he starts asking the craziest things about it. That's a bad challenge. But the worst is because my English is not as it should be. He asks me questions when he asks people to draw things or to find what that is the meaning of the world, uh, a word that I don't know what it means. And I have to draw that word. That makes me suffer enormously. Uh, basically, we arrive to certain logical conclusions, but that's a tough one that he does. Yeah. As we've been doing all this, Jewel Shepard has become the sweetheart of the chat room, and she she wants to know, because uh, somebody else has asked, has asked this a couple of times, Sergio, on your shelf, what are those red thingies behind you? 
Oh, those are little devils. What happened is that in Mexico, we have a, um, a collection in Christmas, the manger, you know, and, and uh, they have other words for it, but they have the St. Joseph, the Virgin, the little Jesus, angels, lambs, ducks, lakes, everything, everything, everything. And there's always one devil, which is the temptations of Jesus in, in a corner. And I wanted to collect, I didn't, I didn't, could collect the whole mangers because this, these are beautiful handcraft, different from each one. They cost less than a dollar. And different families in Guadalajara and in Puebla and in different states, they make them. For, so I figured that one, one I, I don't want to collect little Jesuses or little virgins or St. Joseph. So I start collecting the little devil. And every time I went to Mexico, I went to the markets, usually at the Feria del Libro, the book fair in Guadalajara, I had a great market. So I bought a couple of them and through the years of my visit to visit family, during Christmas, I will buy a couple of devils. Nothing that I have with devils or anything. It's just that it's a handcraft little figure. Uh, like, like they are like this, you know, handcraft, and uh, they have little objects. Some are musicians and they have instruments, but they are all different. And uh, this one is, they have the wings that they move, you know, they put them with a wire. But so I've been collecting them, like I collect the Simpsons too, you know, that, but there's no, uh, and the faces are amazing. So that's what they are. <laughs> Okay. Um, I think we're going to wrap this thing up here. Uh, we, I'm very pleased that this went well, and I thank Sergio for taking the time. When we get to, he and I get together, we talk. How, how many people did we have a chance to? There's, two, there's, two, there's, two, there's 207 online right now. Ah, uh, wonderful. We probably had about, um, uh, probably about a tenth of them, or men, no, a little more than that, have, have posted uh, comments and questions and and, and things like that. We didn't get to all of them. We'll do this again one of these days. We'll do this again one of these days. Um, uh, I've known Sergio now for an awful long time. We were going to tell you the story of how we met, but it's it's too long. This will this will go forever. Um, but one of the joys of my life has been knowing this man and working with him and seeing all the goodness radiate. I'll tell you something about Sergio you may not know. We've, we've traveled to a lot of conventions together. And often we're, 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 we're someplace where there is a touristy type of attraction. We go down to the beach where there's a boardwalk or there's some place where they have these kids who sit there and do caricatures. You've seen these many times where these, these young artists are sitting there and they have samples of their work. And usually the samples they have are either more trucker or Tom Richmond swipes. <laughs> but these are beginning cartoonists who the only job they can get at this stage of their careers is sitting there doing caricatures for tourists. And what I see happen often is when we're there is Sergio will go, let me, let's go say hello to them. He'll go down and he'll introduce himself to each one of those beginning artists. They all know who, you, who he is. They all read Mad Magazine. They all are shocked that it's the Sergio. A couple of them, I don't believe it who he was at first. And he gives them encouragement and he gives them a feeling of importance and he tells them to keep at it. And he gives them maybe a, a few little drawing tips and such. And there are probably a lot of kids today who are working as professional cartoonists who were inspired by Sergio's kindness to them, their niceness, his niceness, the fact that he loves cartooning and therefore loves cartoonists so much. And that is one example of, you know, 80, I could probably sit here and cite about how nice this man is. And he, as you can see, he speaks English perfectly well. He's put up with me mocking his English for, uh, for years because it's like the one thing I can make fun of. It's like people make fun of Dick Van Dyke's accent in Mary Poppins because that's the only thing they've got. There's no there's no insults for Dick Van Dyke other than that you can't you can't pick on his his you know his age his height or anything like that he's just so beloved Sergio is much the same way and it's been a, it's been and it's been great being associated with him and writing on his coattails and and 
being associated with him that way. And uh, and please, can I be paid? Please, can I be paid? <laughs> um, Anyway, anyway, um, I keep doing these chats here for a while. We're having fun with them. Tomorrow night, um, I'm going to do uh, have Shelley Goldstein, who is a wonderful comedy writer and a wonderful chanteuse and cabaret performer. Friday night, I'm going to have uh, Bill Kirkenbauer. Uh, Monday, one uh, Saturday at one o'clock, we've got the cartoon voice panel right in this space we are here come back and, and watch that and after that i'm going to figure out what i want to do with this but i know we'll do some more of these online chats um i wanted to, uh, i've already got paul levitz and scott shaw lined up to do some of them next week and maybe after that uh hey jewel you want to do an online chat you want to come on jewel and i'll talk to you for a while jewel t text to me say yes Um, okay, she'll, she'll, she'll say yes. I'll make her say yes. Actually, no, nobody, nobody makes Jewel do anything. Hey, Sergio. Sergio, yeah. look who we just got online. We, he just wrote such to a us. guy. He's a maestro. Okay. Hola, All right. son. Oh, man. He's, he's so part intrinsic of, of Guru. I mean, he's a man who has created Usagi Yojimbo which is one of the most popular characters in the comic book industry. He not only draws it, he writes it, he lectures it, he does everything about it. And he still is so busy that he takes time to let her grow. And besides that, he's a terrific friend and uh, has been for long, many, many years. Great cartoonist, great artist. Set, when we did Gru, when Gru was at Epic Comics at Marvel, we did 120 issues in 120 months, no fill-ins, no reprints. The book always came out on time. I think it was the only comic of that day that could be set of. And one of the main reasons it was never late was Stan Sakai. Yeah. And another big reason was Tom Luth, who uh, did The Magic. Impossible. I mean, I mean, if the work color had been lousy, it would have been amazing that he got it done as efficiently as he did, but the coloring was wonderful every time he did it. And I, I, I uh, uh, he became, he made himself more important than colorists usually are on a comic book. And colorists oh, are yeah. very important, but Stan, be, uh, uh, Tom uh, rather became part of the finished look of Gru and look of feel Gru had a lot to do with him. Uh, uh, and, and, hey, Stan, you want to do one of these sometime soon? Sakai, Stan Sakai, you want to do one of these chats soon? Wow. Yeah. Okay. There's a delay actually because we're seeing them. We're not seeing them as fast as they come up here. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, Stan, your public wants you to do a chat. Uh, thank you all, folks. This uh, video will be online to replay. If it disappears for a while, it will come back, but it will be online so you can watch it again, or if you came in late, you can start it from the beginning. And tomorrow night, please join me for Shelley Goldstein and join me Friday night for Bill Kirkenbauer. And join me in thanking this guy over here who's on that side because I'm pointing the wrong way. Uh, thank you, Sergio. And I'll talk to you off the line, offline. Very good. Sure. Goodbye, everybody. Good night. Take care. Very important.